Hey everyone, Leslie Rice here, creator of The Signal, with some great news. As you've probably noticed, we've added some wonderful new features to the show, such as our excellent new title cards and our website, www.signalhorrorpodcast.com. We're back on track as far as our schedule goes, and on the whole, it's a great time to be alive and producing the quality content you know and love. Over the last few months, the show's continued to grow and evolve, and we really want to continue to do so with your help. I feel the good content not only comes from the creator, but from listening to the fans. So if you'd like to provide us with feedback, suggestions, or even just moral support, feel free to email us at thisisthesignal at gmail.com by leaving comments on our YouTube channel, or even by whispering them quietly into your pillow at night. Don't worry, we'll hear. This is an important time in the growth of the show, so please, anything you have to say has value. Of even more value is your sharing us with the world, either by writing a review, rating us, or just following us on Twitter and Facebook. The more people we reach, the better. Lastly, if you absolutely love this show or my other shows, you can actually get episodes up to three days early, exclusive access to bonus content, and even a chance to get acknowledged for your contribution on our website. Be sure to either head there and subscribe, or check it out at patreon.com slash signalobscura. Donations start at $2 a month, so please feel free to stop by and have a look. After all, what's the worst that could happen? This is the signal. Point of origin. Unknown. Destination? Unclear. It carries with it fragments of other places, other times, stories from unfathomable pits of darkness, and worlds of unquenchable, all-consuming light. These tales of realities both unimaginably distant and terrifyingly close are woven into, around, and through The Signal. Hello listeners, and welcome to this brief intermission as we attempt to relocate the subjects of our previous transmission. The signal's reach is vast, touching many places throughout space, time, and other more esoteric factors of existence. As we search, let us examine some of these contact points. Worlds where a killer can shed himself of his unwanted impulses, but only by shedding considerably more than just that. Realities where an absurd avian anomaly turns deadly. And places where an unusual nocturnal visitor weaves the stuff of nightmares into the thin fabric of reality. And so, dear listeners, let's forge our way forward with tonight's first story. I have put my heart and my soul into my work and have lost my mind in the process. This quote from Vincent Van Gogh illustrates perfectly the thin line between artistic genius and madness. For what is an artist, if not someone who lives to pour the contents of their mind onto a canvas for the world to see, who has eroded the lines between their conscious and subconscious mind until they are able to pull forth images from the darkest recesses of their psyche? And more intriguingly, what happens when something even worse bubbles to the surface? Such is the subject of our next tale, from the horror-creating collective known as Maletopia. For here, an artist travels to a far dark country, seeking not only to pull from the deepest well of the mind, but to drain the poison that rests there completely. So, listen well to the story of... Red Rembrandt. The small city of Distoria appeared directly after the great darkness of 1999. It was nearly the exact twin of the much older common castle, the two lying separated by only a small stretch of woods. Distoria differed from its sibling by means of a far more aged appearance and a sickly aesthetic that informed it with no small amount of seething menace. It was believed by some that Distoria was a dark reflection of its twin, and anyone who fell asleep in Common Castle three times would be darkly replicated within Distoria. 
Blogger Marcus Hum, who wrote extensively about the Great Darkness, received a strange email after publishing an article about Distoria. Below are the contents of that email. I drove through the thick woods to get to Common Castle. The entire trip was like a long song of dark memories, interspersed with numerous faces glowing in a violent red. The notes of the song started softly enough, but ended huge and solemn, churning and shaking like gigantic things dying slowly beneath the earth. I was relieved when my destination emerged, melting from the woods like a sickening fog. The town was just a specter of old wood and stone, piled up in a dreary, half-sleeping sort of way. The place was almost entirely given over to the woods, just a plaything for the scrub rush and thickets. A cast-off mask of man, resting in a web of brambles, with broken branches and dandelions poking through its eye holes. Despite the new focus of my attention, I could still hear the last bits of my journey sinking further into subterranean song, playing to an unforgiving audience outlined in blood and scowls. I sought out the small apartment I had arranged for previously. The interior seemed carved from the city's long-lost past, better suited for a ghost. I unpacked the tools of my trade and immediately napped for a few hours, hoping to shake loose the journey's dark song. My sleep was plagued by countless hands, each one busy sorting through my mind. It felt like my entire being had been broken down into tiny pieces and placed on a conveyor belt. Pale fingers plucked my thoughts from the moving belt and lifted them into the darkness to be examined by inhuman eyes. I could even hear the rusty grinding of a machine, no doubt a proven creature of metal that oversaw my orderly deconstruction. My mind, divided between two receptacles of rusty steel, was at last reorganized. I woke up. I had been in town for mere hours and had already experienced one of the signature phenomenons alleged to haunt it, the processing. I thought the dream merely an echo of a myth, as I had refreshed my memory of the various legends surrounding Common Castle only days before my arrival. Feeling renewed and ready to get on with things, I let my concerns linger where they may. As I made my way to the street, my drawing materials packed neatly into my messenger bag, twilight filled the once empty lanes with long and lanky shadows. No one but myself seemed to be about. Darkness fell while I wandered the city. Those I encountered were few and furtive, dodging behind ruined buildings and into back alleyways. I soon recognized darkness was something the city had long forgotten how to ward off. Only a few streets heard the minute buzz of electric lights. Eventually, I came to a small, empty park, a few struggling lanterns pouring pools of orange on the ground. The scene appeared more than adequate for my purposes, so I sat upon a rickety picnic table and withdrew an art pad. All around me a slight breeze played, sometimes displacing my drawings into the grass, and I found the experience of sketching in a darkened, haunted town quite thrilling. However, after tonight... I hoped I would have no further use for the remaining tools still reposed within my bag. I drew for hours, it seemed, when in fact I had fallen asleep. That cool, whispering breeze must have been too much for me. And so I dreamed. It wasn't necessarily the terrible dream so many others reported having. It was rather beautiful, like a graveyard thickly frosted in autumn moonlight. In this dream, I was still situated in the park, precisely at the spot I occupied before sleep took me. Yet, the world around me had changed. It had grown far darker than any waking world would have allowed, as even the softest shadow seemed deeper than a rabbit hole. I also noticed that the once autumnal trees were now without their coats of brightly colored leaves. Yet, despite their lack of foliage, they were certainly not without attire. They were wrapped in membranous black silk, a doubtful substance that wavered between solidity and liquescence. The material was everywhere, seeming to hang upon the night sky as the breeze informed it with unwholesome shapes. I focused my gaze downward and realized that I too was covered in the stuff. It came away easily enough, but it didn't blow away as it should have. It became a twisting black shape that resisted the push of the dreaming wind. Even in my sleep, I realized I was experiencing another well-known common castle secret. The culling. I knew the shape would soon resemble me, so I waited for my features to reproduce themselves upon the shifting mass. Within seconds, if time means anything at all within a dream, 
I stood before myself. While the resulting creature looked like me in every detail, the simulacrum was considerably fouler than me, a more concentrated version of my worst possible self. I smiled when I saw the knife appear in its right hand. At the same time, my own right hand seemed to lose a practiced dexterity. I took a moment to soak in the darkness around me, knowing for a few fleeting moments I breathed the air of the twisted city of Distoria. My twin took a last look at me, a disgusted scowl on his face, and departed into the darkness. I awoke to the whispered glow of dawn and quickly gathered my things, making my way back to my borrowed residence. Only one more dream to go, and my business would be concluded. The day was unspectacular, as the nighttime had shown me far more than sunlight ever could. I sketched and painted for most of the day, assuring my lethargy when the time came. Occasionally I would hear the footsteps of persons traveling on the sidewalk beyond my high windows, moving with a peculiar gait. I was unbothered by their staggering presence, as they always kept to themselves. I was far more interested in the sketches I was working on. They were unusual subjects for me, forests and sunsets. Eventually, finding my curiosity too great to resist, I walked through the thick woods to Common Castle's twisted reflection, Distoria. The city was supposed to be less than two decades old, yet it looked like it had risen from the earth itself hundreds of years ago. It indeed appeared to be the exact, yet considerably more perverse, duplicate of Common Castle in every regard. It certainly lived up to its reputation, which was what I was betting on. I was eager to see what the dark twin of my room might look like, so I walked to the Distorian version of the house where I had rented the apartment. The building was precisely where it should have been, but like the rest of the city's aesthetic departures from its twin, it swelled with monstrous features. Gargoyle-like shapes reached out from above door frames and chimney stones, strange statues rose from the loam of the courtyard, and the building materials looked as if they were derived from more humanoid sources rather than quarried stone and milled wood. I entered the structure, despite the fear that began to grip me. Yet, I deserved to feel fear. It was only fair. Light, clearly, wasn't welcome anywhere in the house. The ample windows seemed no more capable of admitting it than the walls. I imagined the night left a bit of itself behind, after each of its many cyclical visits. One day, the innards of the house would most likely appear blacker than tar. That suited me just fine. I would never be back. When I entered my room, the first thing I noticed were the paintings spread out on the desk. They were painfully and shamefully familiar. Face after face, red as twilight. Yet it meant that it was all working. I took some solace in that. The images stared from drawing paper, yellowed with age, and lined with cracks. If I hadn't known better, I would have assumed that they were decades old. Yet it didn't matter what they looked like or how old they were. I was almost done. The shadows around the house began to overflow as the night fell from the sky. I needed to return to my home and dream. Back at my apartment in Common Castle, I looked at my crumpled bag next to the bed, wondering what might remain inside it. I gazed out the window beyond the woods, aware that I was facing the window of the doppelganger room I had recently departed. I could even feel something trying to look back at me, if only through dimly constructed and incomplete eyes. I stretched out on the bed, put my head on the pillow, and dreamed the third dream. It's difficult to say what I experienced that night, save that I was filled with the last nightmares I would ever have. I saw so many faces burning like small red stars just before they disappeared altogether from my consciousness. Something locked me to an old rusted chair somewhere in the basement of the world. A knife slid across my throat and I bled pure red venom into a rusted bucket. After I was drained to the last, I saw a gigantic paintbrush tipped with old haggard bristles dip itself into my blood. Upon the yellowed paper that stretched before me, I saw my image painted. Once more I was face to face with myself. I think he expected me to scream. All I could utter was, thank you. 
I awoke, and the curing was complete. As I packed my things up to leave, I hefted my bag in the air. It was light as a baby's breath, and so was I. My trip back home was filled with the silence of forgotten faces and the lightness of an emptied conscience. I marveled at the turning leaves of autumn. It's been three years since I left Common Castle, and in that time I've married and had a child. I work a normal job and I sleep through the night. I still paint, but now only the beauty of nature moves across my campus. Of course, the red Rembrandt killings continue unabated, but far more violent and gruesome than before. And the portraits of the victims, always painted in their own curdling blood, grow increasingly more realistic. But now, unlike before, I have nothing to do with any of it. Thanks to that dark town, I am free. As thin as the line between genius and madness may be, there is another separation that may be even slimmer, the distance between terror and the absurd. The fields of comedy and horror have much in common, after all. They deal in the unexpected, the unusual, and the subversion of the natural order. But at what point does that which might give us a chuckle become that which gives us a scream instead? Is it a question of circumstance, magnitude, or is it simply the severity of the consequences? Whatever the case, the lead of our next story, written by the author known as Enki V2, is about to discover that the ridiculous is often no laughing matter. For when her end came, what other choice did she have? She could have continued to run, but instead... She awaited the turkeys. The load-bearing wall groaned behind her. She would need to move again soon. Houses used to last a lot longer. This was the third in as many weeks, and she had put off leaving for longer than was wise. The previous tenants had left furniture, and she almost convinced herself that the smell of rotting carrion was actually the nearby sewage treatment facility. Taking a claw hammer from the pocket of her mangled overalls, she peeled some of the boards back from the door jam. Covering her body with a plastic tub, she pushed her way through three or four feet of bloodied feathers and claws. The smell no longer bothered her, but without the tub she would be smothered before she could be crushed, and the tub provided valuable protection from the rain of small winged bodies as she made her way to the next shelter. This area was developed during the last real estate boom, and so almost any house she found would probably be abandoned. She risked a glimpse at the sky, but it was pointless. As usual, the sun was blotted out. For her efforts, she received a white-capped chickadee in the eye. When she was young, her parents and friends thought it was a blessing and treated it like a parlor trick. They'd make jokes about Disney princesses and sing that carpenter song. It wasn't until she was 10 years old that the rate had accelerated to the point of being distressing. Her family had to replace the sliding glass doors on the porch with something opaque, and shortly afterward painted the outside of the house a dull rust color to hide the blood. When the roof of that house finally collapsed, they were still in denial, unprepared. Only she escaped. She had been in this development for a year, or maybe two. It was hard to keep track anymore. The birds kept coming in thicker, She wore rubber rain boots that went up above her knees, tucked into her pants. Nevertheless, some songbirds, already mostly rotten, fell inside as she shuffled through some of the taller mounds and became squished between her leg and the outside of the boot, beaks and claws and little bones pressing into her flesh. As she pushed through a front door, she felt an unusually large thump on her tub. A hawk, maybe. She pushed the door closed, reinforcing it with boards and nails with a practiced ease. Then, satisfied, she turned around to survey the rest of the building. But the back end of the house had already collapsed. She must have already stayed here. She heard a banging to her left, but it jogged her memory. This was the place with the wild turkeys. She had thought having turkey would be nice, 
an easy meal. She had underestimated their strength. That time, she had barely escaped. She had been much stronger then, inside for nearly a month. Unable to imagine herself summoning the strength to pull out the boards and trudge through another deluge, she slumped, her back against the door. She awaited the turkeys. Art and insanity, humor and horror. Tonight has been a night of exploring the barriers between different lands that, while dissimilar on the surface, nevertheless share a border. And to close out our broadcast, there is one final frontier that bears examining. That strange, dark territory that bridges the waking world and the land of nightmare. In our next story from the writer known as Professional Succubus, a man finds himself stranded in that same shadowed realm. And although he may not be alone, there's little doubt that he's going to wish he was. For what person wouldn't prefer to find themselves alone, rather than under the observation of the Mohawk Man? Percy woke suddenly, chills crawling from his scalp down to his heels. It took him a few moments for the dark world around him to make sense. It was his vacation. He was in a hotel. His girlfriend Kayla had stolen the sheets while they slept, and the loud buzz to his left was the old air conditioner kicking to life. Beyond that, he could hear the soft splashing of the hotel's courtyard fountain and the palm trees rustling in the breeze. The strangest thing, though, was the blue light filtering into the room. Its intense beam intruded through a crack in the curtains and cast strange patterns on the walls. Percy forced himself to his feet and walked over to the window. Still groggy, he jabbed at the AC controls with one hand and reached up to close the curtains with the other. However, once he glanced out the window, he stopped. There was a white van parked in the courtyard, which was already strange as the courtyard wasn't meant for vehicles, and a bright blue light poured out of its windows. Confused and still half asleep, Percy furrowed his brow, hoping that the image would start to make sense. It didn't. A silhouette appeared from inside the van. Percy could see the light reflecting off a pair of high cheekbones, thick goggles, and above those, a mohawk. The person widened their jaws, and what looked like a tongue emerged from their mouth. It extended at least a foot, much longer than a normal tongue should. At the end of the thing's tongue was something bulbous which wriggled like it had a mind of its own. It was in this moment that Percy relaxed. I'm dreaming, he told himself. I watched Alien last week and now I'm dreaming about steampunk alien van dwellers. There was a loud crack and Percy abruptly jolted awake. The same blue light illuminated the room. Beginning to sweat, Percy uncertainly approached the window again and was greeted with the same white van and the same impossible figure sitting inside. Acidic fear coursed through him, burning away the last remnants of lethargy. He automatically looked behind him to Kayla, as though her presence could somehow verify whether this was reality or not. She lay on her stomach, where she had been before. Percy thought about waking her and decided against it. It would be more trouble than it was worth. This was, after all, the girl who slept through fireworks and war movies. Percy turned back to the window, continued to stare at the van. Was the person lost? Were they hurt? How had they even gotten the van into the courtyard without anybody noticing? The van would have damaged the walkways and stairs and made one hell of a racket. It was like it had been quietly dropped in from above. He thought of simply ignoring it, but his inquisitive side, nosy Kayla would have teased, knew that wasn't an option. Plus, he wouldn't be able to get back to sleep anyway, not with that damn glaring blue light. Maybe he would just go out there, make sure nothing was wrong, and ask them to turn the light down or off. Slipping on his sandals, Percy tucked his keycard into his pocket and ventured out into the breezeway. Immediately, he was assailed by the stench of rotten eggs. Gagging slightly, he reassured himself, that's what real ocean air smells like, rotting marine life and vegetation. The smell got worse the closer Percy came to the van. The light became stronger too, he had to hold up his hands to protect his eyes from the intensifying rays. 
When he was an arm's length away from the window, the silhouette suddenly swiveled toward him. Percy heard glass breaking, and Percy opened his eyes blearily. Without knowing why, he felt relief that the light in the room was warm, not blue. No more illegally parked vans, no more rotten sea smell, and no more irritating lights. He smiled, already thinking about how he would describe his dream to Kayla. He reached for her and touched something cold and rigid. A low whine filled the room. It took Percy a full minute to realize that the sound was coming from him. Kayla lay on her back, empty eye sockets staring up at the ceiling. Delicate lines of dried blood on the corner of each eye created the illusion of grotesque goggles. Her hair was stained a rusty red around the temples. Percy could see the mattress through a third small hole in her throat. He heaved and reeled back against the dresser. His hand brushed up against an unexpected object. On top of the dresser was a thick pair of goggles, a knit hat with a thick mohawk-like fringe on top, a pair of car keys, and a note. Percy picked up the note with shaking hands. It read, If you want to put things back the way they were, put on the goggles, put on the mask, and get in the van. Percy huddled in the back seat of the van. The entire van reeked of rotting meat, as did the goggles and hat he'd found. He was breathing in for a five count, then out for five. But even this exercise did nothing to calm his pounding heart. He examined the hat more closely, desperate to complete any task but the one in front of him. Kayla, he said to himself, trying to goad himself into bravery. It's for Kayla. He climbed into the driver's seat, put the key in the ignition, and the van roared to life. His fingers tingled. He knew he couldn't avoid it anymore. He put on the goggles, then the hat. The goggles' rubber straps suddenly sprang to life and wrapped around his forehead and neck before forcing themselves down his throat. When he pulled at them, they burned. When he opened his mouth, a long rubber tongue burst out, moving and gibbering independently. Percy's horror washed over him like the ocean had earlier in the day. The van was suddenly blasted with blue light, and Percy couldn't help but emit a scream. When the light dissipated, Percy was in the parking lot of a different hotel. The room directly in front of him had the curtains cracked, and inside he could see a boy and a girl settling down to sleep. Remorse rose from his gut, and he vaguely hoped that they could sense his sorrow, even though he knew from experience they could not. When the hotel room light clicked off, the blue light in the van turned on. And so, dear listeners, we reach one final barrier tonight, the end of our broadcast. And while we've crossed from imagination to insanity, mirth to the macabre, and from reality to nightmare, I'm afraid it's best that we part ways before this last seal is broken. Don't fear, though, listeners. We'll be opening that gateway again when we return allowing you another glimpse of the strange, dark territory we travel through. Until then, though, we'll simply say this, that we'll see you next time on The Signal. Hi everybody, me again, and I really hope you liked this episode. Sorry that it took me a little longer to get it out, but I have actually been recovering from pneumonia, bronchitis, and sinusitis. And while I've been dealing with life's own personal brand of body horror, now it's time to thank those who brought us this episode. As always, voices for today's stories come from myself, and also from Ashley Webb Rice. Music comes partly from me, but mostly courtesy of Kevin McLeod, whose excellent work can be found at www.incompetech.com. As always, we appreciate your support, and to find out how you can help, please visit us at www.signalhorrorpodcast.com or donate at patreon.com slash signalobscura. Remember, one of the easiest ways to help the show is to like, subscribe, and above all, share our work with everyone you can. At the best, they'll love you for it. And at the worst, well... What is the worst that could happen?